Please go ahead and open up in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. If you're having trouble finding Exodus, it's the second book of the Bible, chapter 20. We're going to be jumping back into the Ten Commandments today. We're going to be focusing on the Sixth Commandment, which is the one that forbids murder. And the one thing that most people think that they have going for them is that they haven't murdered anyone. We all know that we're sinners, but it's true that some sins are more heinous than others. And, you know, we think we're not all that bad because, hey, I haven't, I haven't killed anyone. Now, about two weeks ago, I was walking through the church cleaning, and I noticed something that was really, really gross. Okay? In that back window over there, there were two wasps. And these wasps had wiggled their way in one of the tears in the, in the screen, and they were building a nest. Okay. And this nest was probably about the size of a tennis ball. But man, it was gross. Just watching those little terrorists crawling all over that thing, laying their eggs and building that nest. And I kind of watched it for fascina with fascination for just a little bit. But then I was like, I have to do something about this. Okay. Two wasps are a problem. Okay. Doors get left open around here all the time. And if one of those wasps gets in here, it's, gonna, it's probably going to stink someone. It's not going to be good. But if I didn't do anything about it and just left it there, what's going to happen? That nest is going to grow. Those little boogers are going to breed. Okay? And what was once two wasps is going to turn into a huge swarm of wasps. And I don't know how fast wasp eggs hatch. And I don't know how quickly they can build that nest. But if I leave it alone, it's going to turn into a big problem. So what do I do? Okay, I, I'm thinking back, and I remember, I remember hearing something about soapy water killing wasps. And the reason why it kills wasps is because they breathe through their skin. And so if they get soap on them, they can't breathe. And so they suffocate, and then they die. So what do I do? I go back to the kitchen, and I get a cup, and I make some soapy water. And I come out, and I come around the, the building, and, I'm, and by the time I get to right about here, I'm going real slow, okay? Because I don't know how many more of those buggers there are. And I'm going real slow, and I'm, and I'm like kind of trying to hug the fence, and I see them. And so, this is what I do. <laughs> I got out of there, <laughs> okay? I got out of there. It was probably really funny to watch because I, I was sprinting around. And I, and I come back around, and I come in here, and I look in the window, and they're dead. The wasps are dead. It worked. But I, I don't trust it. <laughs> I leave it for a couple minutes. And then I come back, and they're still dead. And so I very tenderly and very gently, because I don't know if there's any wasps up in that nest. I, I very tenderly and gently open the window, and I take the cup, and I get a stick and I knock the nest into the cup, and then I take care of the nest. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that illustration here in a minute. Hopefully, you're in Exodus chapter 20. Um, if you wouldn't mind, please stand as we read God's word. Hear the words of the living God. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, or the sojourner who's within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. 
Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Amen. Thanks be unto God for his word. You may be seated. Let's ask the Lord for some help as we think about the sixth commandment. O oh Lord, our God, you have the words of eternal life. Lord, your words are sweet on our lips. They're honey to our tongues. And Lord, I pray that you would please convict us of sin, stir us up toward righteous living. Lord, conform us more to the image of your Son by your word this morning. We ask this in the name of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, a quick reminder about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the summary of God's moral law. The summary of God's moral law. The moral law is that transcendent law that God expects all people everywhere to keep and to obey. On the last day, we're all going to be judged by God's moral law. Have you perfectly kept all of God's commandments in his moral law. And I'm sorry to tell you this, but none of us have. We are all breakers of God's law, and therefore, on the last day, we will be sentenced to hell without a Savior. But God, in the abundance of his love and mercy, has sent us a Savior in our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who did keep God's moral law, perfectly. He kept every one of God's commands. He never sinned. He did everything that God asked him to do, and he did nothing that God told him not to do. And the Lord promises that if you will repent of your sins, turn away from them, and believe in Christ alone for salvation, Jesus Christ will make a trade with you. Here's what he'll do. He'll trade you your sin for his righteousness. He will take all of your guilt and your condemnation that you deserve for breaking God's moral law, and he will bear the punishment for it on the cross. And he will give you all of the favor that God has toward him for keeping his moral law. And you will live with him forever in heaven. That's the promise of the gospel. But once the Lord redeems you, you're not free to live however you want. The Lord our God and the man Jesus Christ has bought you. He is your master. You are his slave. You owe unto him the obedience of faith in keeping his word. And so the Ten Commandments, they show us not only our guilt, but they also show us what God expects of those that he has saved. Now, Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. You shall not murder. Now, you're probably holding a modern translation. And if you, if, in verse 13, it says, murder. You shall not murder. That's a fine translation. But the problem with that translation is that the word murder is too specific. There are other kinds of killings that are not murder that are also intended by that Hebrew word there. And so, if you have an ESV, you'll probably see a footnote, and it's a good footnote. It says, the Hebrew word also causes, also covers causing human death through carelessness or negligence. And that's why, you know, your older translations, like the King James Version, will read, thou shalt not kill. But the problem with translating that word kill is that it's too broad. There are some killings that the Lord our God condones. There are some acts of taking human life that our Lord permits and even recommends. So the pro we don't have a good English word that will map onto the Hebrew word exactly. But here's the idea. Here's what the, here's what the sixth commandment is forbidding. It means the unjust taking of human life. 
That's what's in your bulletin there. The unjust taking of human life. So let me first clarify what the sixth commandment does not mean. And this is important because there are many people who like to twist the scriptures and try to make them say say things that they don't say, mean things that they don't mean. There's people who would try to apply the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, to situations that it does not apply to. So what are some of them? I've, I've given you five there. Number one, the sixth commandment does not apply when God takes a life. The sixth commandment does not apply when God takes a life. And the reason why is because God is the giver of life. And therefore, he has the right to take it away from those that he wills. Our lives belong ultimately to the Lord our God. And he, it, it, <laughs> he can do with what's his, whatever he wants. We don't get to tell him, hey God, you can't do that. And it's also true that each one of us is a sinner. From the moment of conception, we are sinners. We're born in sin, we're born in Adam. And the wages of sin is death. And God is the judge of all the earth. And the judge of all the earth shall do rightly. Every moment that we are alive, our lives are not owed to us. Every moment that we, are, that we breathe, every breath that we breathe in is a gift from a gracious and a patient God. So you're not entitled to life. And no is anyone, neither is anyone else. But God, because he is gracious and merciful and kind, preserves our lives in his good time. So it's God's right to take away the life of a human being. Number two. The sixth commandment does not apply when a human takes the life of an animal. Now, this doesn't mean that we have free license to just Go out and execute squirrels willy-nilly, okay? I'm not saying that we should go out there and go on a squirrel genocide, okay? But the Lord does expect us to take care of his creation, to be wise stewards of the natural resources that he has given us. But God is pretty clear in Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, when he says, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. So it's just not true when the PETA folks out there say that meat is murder. Okay? According to God, meat is not murder. Meat is delicious. Okay? So it doesn't apply to the life of an animal. Number three. The sixth commandment does not forbid lawful self-defense. And we see this in Exodus chapter 22, where God says... If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him. So according to the Lord, if there is someone who's breaking into your home, your conscience need not be burdened to shoot them for fear of breaking the sixth commandment. Now, there's various unjust laws that have been passed in our country, and I don't have time to get into that. I don't have time to parse out every single case. You can ask me later, what about this? What about that? But in general, the Lord permits us to protect life and property by the means of deadly force if necessary. Okay? Number four, it is not murder when a criminal who has been justly convicted of a capital offense is executed. The death penalty is not murder. There are so many texts in the Bible where God commands that a criminal would be executed that no serious Christian can make the case that the death penalty is immoral. The Lord very clearly prescribes the death penalty in cases of Murder, manslaughter, human trafficking, rape, adultery, and other crimes. And after each criminal has received their due process, the Lord wants those criminals to be executed. 
And we see this even in the New Testament. In Romans 13, the Lord gives to the government, the civil authorities, the power of the sword to wield against the evildoers. And that sword would be exercised in, among other punishments, the death penalty. And how do we know what evil is unless we go to God and look in his word and let him define what is evil and what is good? So how do we know what an evildoer is who deserves a capital punishment? Well, we got to look in God's word. So a Christian judge or a Christian executioner can perform his duties with a clear conscience. Number five, it is not murder when a person is killed in the process of a just war. Again, there are so many times in the Old Testament where the Lord tells his people to go to war. He tells them, and he permits the nation of Israel to respond with warfare when they are attacked. No serious Christian can make the case that just warfare is against God's word or is breaking the sixth commandment. If they would claim that, then they're either not serious or they've never read their Bibles. Again, I don't have time to define just wars, but it will just serve our purposes to know that to kill another person in the process of executing a just war is not breaking the sixth commandment. All right. So that's what's not forbidden. Now, the rest of my sermon, we're going to be talking about what's forbidden and what's required in the Sixth Commandment. And I've listed a lot of verses there, and I'm going to be referencing them. So here we go. What kinds of sins are addressed by the Sixth Commandment? Number one, every kind of murder and manslaughter. It is a sin to commit an intentional act that directly brings about the death of another human being without sufficient cause. And we live in a society where, by God's grace, most of us still know that murder is wrong. But most people in our society could not give you a very good reason as to why murder is wrong. Is murder wrong just because it's against the law? No. Is murder wrong just because we just have a society has have decided that we shouldn't, we can't maintain a society as long as we're killing one another? No, that's not why murder is wrong. The reason why murder is wrong is because God made human beings in his image. In the beginning, when God created man and woman, he made them in his image. Genesis 6, 9. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For, here's the reason, God made man in his own image. That's why murder's wrong. What does it mean to be made in God's image? Well, in short, what, here's what it means. It means that we are made to be like God in that he has given us the right to rule over his creation as his representatives. He's given us the right to rule over his creation as his representatives. So we represent God in our nature as little kings and queens who take dominion over God's creation. That's what it means to be made in God's image. Now I have a question. By a show of hands, how many of you are offended as an American, when you see someone burning the American flag. Okay, good. That's what I hope to see, right? Why is that offensive? It's because that flag represents your country. It represents you. It represents your people. And when people burn it and step on it and desecrate it, they're expressing hatred of you and our people and our country. That flag represents us. That's exactly why God takes murder so personally. We represent him on the earth. We are little pictures, little symbols of him. I want to borrow an illustration from a well-known pastor. And he describes our broken relationship with God as if we are a band of frenzied villagers in the medieval times. We, We live in the valley, but we dislike the king who lives in a castle on the hill. And we don't have enough strength to attack him in his castle, although we would if we could. And so we settle for the next best thing. We can't can't topple the king, 
but we can burn something that looks like him and represents him down here in the valley. We can burn him in effigy. We can't touch the king, but we can destroy his images. So every time we break the sixth commandment, God views it as an attack on himself. We voice our direct rebellion and hatred of God when we snuff out the lives of his image bearers. Number two, the second kind of killing that breaks the sixth commandment is hiring an assassin or murder for hire. To put it simply, God is not stupid. Okay? You don't get to hide behind the flimsy excuse, oh, I didn't pull the trigger, I paid somebody else to do it, okay? In other words, Pharaoh didn't get off the hook just because he had his soldiers kill all of the Hebrew baby boys. No, he, Pharaoh was just as much a murderer as the soldiers who did it. Deuteronomy 27, 25. Cursed be anyone who takes a bribe to shed innocent blood. And this is why when a, when a woman goes and gets an abortion, she is just as much a murderer as the doctor who ripped apart that little baby. She hired an assassin to shed the innocent blood of her preborn child. And why modern day Christians are confused about this I, is beyond me. Number three, the sixth commandment also forbids suicide. Suicide is self murder, it's the premature ending of one's own life. When a person commits suicide, they show contempt for the image of God in themselves. Now, I just want to say at this point that I shouldn't take it for granted that, there's, that there isn't anyone in this room who has contemplated suicide. There probably is. Maybe, maybe you've contemplated it recently. And if that's you, I want you to know that, that you're not thinking clearly. You're not thinking clearly. You're not God. You don't have the right to take away or to snuff out the gift of life that God has given you. God has not given you that right. The breath that you're breathing right now is proof that there is a loving God in heaven who loves you and wants to extend the gift of life to you. And we should not insult him by snuffing it out in ourselves. Our God is near to the brokenhearted. He lifts up the poor and the needy. One pastor puts it this way, your life is precious to God even when you have concluded that it's pointless. So if you're still breathing, it's because God wants you to be, and you don't have the right to step into the place of God and to end your own life just because you're depressed or because you're discontent. Okay, so I hope if there's someone in this room who needs to hear that, that you would be jolted, you're not thinking clearly. Now, one exception to this is that it is not sinful to give up your life in an act of self-sacrifice. John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, than what? Than a man would lay down his life for his friends. So a soldier who runs into oncoming gunfire or a firefighter who runs into a burning building and is killed while trying to save others, has not broken the sixth commandment. Jesus Christ is the prime example for us. He was no murderer, but he gave himself up to death in the place of his people. But suicide is no act of self-sacrifice. It's an act of self-murder. Number four, one kind of killing that breaks the sixth commandment is the killing of our neighbor through negligence or carelessness. Now, it was common in the days of ancient Israel for people to go up on their roofs to rest and to relax. And so, God required that when you would build a house, that you would build a wall around your roof. It's called a parapet. This is what he says. Listen to Deuteronomy 22.8. When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet, right, a wall around your roof. 
that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. Now, the point here is this. You must take reasonable precautions to prevent someone from falling off your roof. If you don't, God is going to view you as having their blood on your hands if they fall off. You are guilty of shedding innocent blood if you do not take steps to preserve the life of others. And that principle should be applied to other areas. So if you're at the firing range and you're not taking care and you're, watching, and you're not watching your weapon and you accidentally discharge that weapon and you kill someone, you've broken the sixth commandment. God views you as a murderer. If you've been drinking and you hop behind the wheel of a truck and you kill someone, you're a murderer. You were careless with danger and you caused the unjust death of someone else. This applies to those that carelessly operate heavy machines, those that are not, are not diligent with the prescription of medication, and those who encourage others to take reckless risks. We must take every reasonable effort to preserve our lives and the lives of others. This leads me to the last one, overt act that the sixth commandment forbids, which is indifference toward injustice or the failure to execute justice. Turn in your Bibles with me to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So it's one book after Exodus. This is what the Lord says. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to the people of Israel, Any one of the people of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn in Israel, who gives any of his children to Moloch, shall surely be put to death. So this would be the sin of child sacrifice. If you see someone offering up their child to a false god, that person shall be put to death. And that would apply to the modern child sacrifice of abortion. Can't argue with God, it's what God says. Keep reading. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I myself will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given one of his children to Moloch to make my sanctuary unclean and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do at all close their eyes to that man when he gives one of his children to Moloch and do not put him to death, then I will set my face against that man and against his clan and will cut them off from among their people, him and all who follow him in whoring after Moloch. So God knows, if you know that there is injustice, murder taking place in your land, and you do nothing to stop it. If we as a society fail to execute what God says is justice upon criminal offenders, we are complicit in their acts. The blood guilt that those people have for committing that murder are upon, is upon a society that fails to execute God's justice. Proverbs 22, 11 through 12, sorry, 24, 11 through 12. Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we didn't know this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? So God will judge those who refuse to stand up for the innocent. God views those who see their neighbor dying and doing nothing as guilty of murder. And our land and our society has the blood of millions and millions of preborn babies on its hand. We have been indifferent toward the plight of our neighbors. When we fail to execute God's justice on the murderer and the rapist and on others, we're not being merciful, we're being wicked. 
I knew a guy once who thought that, who was, who had been convicted of a, of a, a sexual crime against children. And this person was astonished that he still had to be on a registry. Are you kidding me? You should be on your knees thanking the Lord God that injustice was done upon you. Because if we had done with you what you ought to have been done with you, you would have been executed. But we live in a land that's full of wickedness and unbelief. And I really think that the Westminster and the Baptist Catechism is very helpful here at this point. Because here's what it says. It has a section on the Ten Commandments, and it asks what each commandment requires and what each commandment forbids. So what's required in the first commandment? The first commandment requireth all lawful endeavors to preserve our own lives and the lives of others. What's forbidden in the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment absolutely forbiddeth the taking away of our own life or the life of our neighbor unjustly or whatsoever tendeth thereunto. Those last three words are the key to unlocking something about the Sixth Commandment. Whatsoever tendeth thereunto. That's, that's a little dense, okay? Basically, that means that if there is an act or if there is an attitude that, if you leave it unchecked, would lead unto murder, then that is also a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Murder is what you get when you allow for one or multiple sins to grow and fester and develop in your heart. Murder happens at the end of a chain of, of other sins that have been left unaddressed and not dealt with early on. Now the thing about wasp stings is that one or two of them really will hurt you, but they won't kill you. But if you get swarmed by wasps, a large number of stings can kill you. And where there's a large swarm of wasps, that means that somewhere nearby, there is a nest that has been left unattended and has grown to uncontrollable proportions. That little nest that started off the size of a tennis ball has now grown into an army of little terrorists that are just looking for someone to kill. Okay? Now, does anyone remember a few years ago during COVID, right, when we all got those new, that news that those giant murder hornets were coming from Asia to the United States? That was scary, wasn't it? Okay? Well, we've got a bigger problem at this church than a few wasps in the window. I hate to tell you this, but we have some nests of murder hornets right here inside. In fact, they're in this room. You've got nests of murder hornets in your heart. Here's the thing. By God's grace, none of these nests have gotten big enough to produce a swarm that can kill yet. Yet. But listen, when, when murder hornets come out of us, That must mean that there's a nest somewhere deep inside. So how do we know that we have a heart that has murder in it? How do we know that we have murder in our hearts? Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 6. He says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. You don't get figs from thorn bushes. You don't get grapes off of a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So here's what that means. What comes out of us reveals what is on the inside. If you have good treasure in your heart, if you're treasuring good things then good things are going to come out of you. If you have evil treasure in your heart, if you're treasuring evil things, then evil things are going to come out of you. Evil things. Murder hornets are going to come out of you. Now let me list for you some of the more popular 
subspecies of murder hornets. Fits of anger, insults, cursing, quarreling, gossiping, backbiting, complaining, indifference, and cruelty. Every appearance of one of those in your life is a murder hornet. And it's a sign that you have murder in your heart. Anger and insults and cursing are all sins that will lead to murder if left unchecked. They're murder hornets. This is why Jesus said, you have, heard it, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Quoting the Sixth Commandment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So what's Jesus saying right there? He's saying that you don't have to have blood on your hands to break the sixth commandment. You can have blood on your heart. He's saying that fits of anger and insults and cursing are hornets that buzz up out of our hearts, out of our mouths, and that attack others. When you have those kind of hornets coming out of you, that must mean that there's murder inside of you. How many murders have been committed because somebody's anger got out of control? Lots. How many killings have taken place because someone insulted and cursed someone else? Countless. Quarreling, gossiping, backbiting, and complaining are also murder hornets that come out of us. These are sins of the tongue that come from a heart full of murder. In other words, character assassination is also murder. Listen to James 3. The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. It is a restless evil full of what? Deadly poison. So you don't have to poison somebody physically to murder them to break the sixth commandment. You could, you could poison them with your tongue. We're killing people with our words. We're assassinating others. Listen to what James says next. This is James 3, 9. With our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the image of God. So did you catch how the image of God is offended when we assassinate other people's character? When we insult, when we quarrel, when we gossip, and when we bicker? It's all connected to murder in the heart. God takes, God takes it as offensive when somebody murders. The, way that, the offense that God takes of that is the same kind of offense that God takes when we speak evil about another. Now listen, this isn't John making this up. This isn't my pontifications about, you know, what I studied. In here. This is God's word. It just says it. I didn't make it up. God's the judge. You got a problem, take it up with him. Listen to what James says right after this in, in chapter 4. What, quor what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Here's the question. What, what's going on in the heart of someone that has murder hornets coming out of them? Is it not this? That your passions are at war within you. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. That's what's going on in the heart. Someone who's got a contentious spirit. They have murder in their heart. What about indifference and cruelty? Those are murder hornets as well. They show us we have murder in our hearts. Remember that the commandment requires us to take all lawful endeavors to preserve our own lives and the lives of others. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Jesus tells a story of a man who was mugged on the way to Jerusalem. And there he is, lying on the side of the road, beaten and bloody and, and, and bleeding out and dying. And there's three people that pass by him, but only one stops and helps. The other two, they're too busy. 
They're, in, they're, they're indifferent. They have other things going on. Now, why does that happen? It's because they've got murder in their hearts. They're indifferent. They've not taken every lawful step to preserve the life or the, their life or the life of another human being. We break the sixth commandment when we're indifferent to the suffering of the innocent. Instead, we are required to show mercy. We're required to. And listen to this. We can't just be concerned. We ought to be concerned for other people's physical welfare, but we ought to be concerned for their spiritual welfare as well, for the spiritual lives of others. Failure to take pity and compassion upon those who we are around who are stumbling towards hell. The failure to take pity on them arises out of a heart of murder, a heart of indifference, a heart of cruelty. It doesn't matter if they go to hell. I guarantee you, myself included, everyone in this room has broken the sixth commandment there. The failure to evangelize, friends, is soul murder. Friends, these are the outward actions that come from hearts that are infested with murder hornets. And the more murder hornets that you have coming out of you, the bigger the nest that's on the inside. And whereas one or two murder hornets might be manageable, at some point, there's going to be enough hornets that are going to be able to swarm out and kill someone. Now, whenever we have a hornet problem, we have to do two things. We have to address the hornets that are in the air. But if all we're doing is running around with a fly swatter, we're never going to solve the problem. Okay? Behavior modification is necessary, but not sufficient. If we don't go hunting for those nests that those murder hornets come out of, we're going to keep having a problem. And we're only going to be swatting at the murder hornets that we see flying around. What about the ones that we don't see? We have to do something about these nests. I want to point out two nests that murder hornets like to grow in, in your heart. There's more, but I think these are the two that are probably the most relevant to us. Here's one. Resentment. A resentful heart is a place where murder hornets grow. Resentment is, is closely tied to two other nests. Hatred and the assumption of evil motives. Are you just holding on to resentment about some, something that so-and-so did to you and you didn't like it? Are you in a place where wherever you think about a particular person, you're always remembering the thing or the things that they do that annoy you? Do you find yourself always interpreting everything that a person does as aggressive or mean-spirited? You're holding on to you're holding on to the wrong that they did to you, and you're turning it over, and you're looking at it, and you're just thinking about it all the time. And there's murder hornets growing. They're laying eggs. They're building that nest. It makes sense why the Apostle John would say in 1 John 3.15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. So how do you kill the nest of resentment? How do you kill it? Well, you kill it with forgiveness. You kill it with giving up your hatred of that person and instead loving them with the love that God has shown to you. You kill resentment by recognizing that no matter what that person has done to you, no matter how badly they have offended you, you have committed infinitely more offensive transgressions against the Lord your God. And yet he's forgiven you in Christ. Jesus told a parable of a man who was, forbidden, or who was forgiven a huge sum of money that he could have never hoped to repay. And that man went and choked out a friend of his that owed him a pittance. That man wasn't really grateful. That man had resentment in his heart that he hadn't rooted out.
Leviticus 19, 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. This cannot be us, brothers and sisters. Are you paying more attention to the thing that that person did against you? Or are you paying more attention to the mercy that God has shown you in Christ? What consumes your thoughts? You're not going to get rid of these thoughts of resentment in your heart unless you replace them with something else. And they need to be thoughts about how much God has forgiven you in Christ. I promise you, if you will stop thinking about yourself and how you've been offended, and if you put the same amount of effort into thinking about Christ that you put into thinking about the offense that somebody has committed against you, you're going to find forgiveness super easy. The book of Proverbs says that good sense makes one slow to anger, and it's, a, it's his glory to overlook an offense. Some of you have been hanging on to resentments about some pretty stupid stuff. And you need to have the wisdom to look at God and what God has done for you in Christ and forgive that silly thing that someone has done against you. Here's another nest that we often have murder hornets coming out of. Pride. Pride. Pride is connected to two other nests, envy and discontentment. Pride is the sinful view of ourselves that assumes rights that don't belong to us. I am so great that I am entitled to praise. I deserve a relaxing evening. I should have nice things. And when pride doesn't receive what it, deser what it thinks it deserves, it develops into envy of someone who has the things that we think that we deserve or discontentment because somebody has taken from us the things that we think that we deserve. We hunger for more and more because after all, we deserve it. And when someone violates our perceived rights, we get angry. So do you find yourself irritable? Just flying off the handle at little things? It's because you have pride in your heart, my friend. The very first murder was committed because of pride. Cain killed his brother Abel because he was angry that God accepted Abel's offering and not his. And his pride was bruised and murder hornets flew out of his mouth and he murdered his brother. How many murders have been committed in the process of a theft? Loads of them. If we allow discontentment to fester... We're going to be so jealous and envious at the things of others that we would be willing to kill them to get the thing that they have that we think we deserve. So how do you kill the nest of pride and envy and discontentment? Well, you kill it with humility. That's how you kill it. You must dig out the root of pride out of your heart with the help of God's Spirit and replace it with Christ-like humility. Here's Philippians 2. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." All of Christ's life was lived in humble submission to the Lord his God. Jesus Christ was entitled to all of the kingdoms of the world. And he refused them because he was ready to receive them from the hand of his Father and not take them for himself. So what do you think that you're entitled to? Whatever it is, you don't deserve it. Jesus deserved it. You don't. So when someone steps on your rights or your feelings, that's going to show you where your treasure is. Do you treasure the dignity and the things that God has given you? Or do you treasure your own pride and the way people think of you? And, you know, I must be respected. We need to look to our master who was the perfect example of humility. 
And he was mistreated and disrespected and maligned and slapped and whipped unjustly. He didn't reach back in a fit of rage and anger like he was entitled to do. Instead, he opened not his mouth. He resigned himself to the will of the Father. And he did this in the place of you and me, friends. The only one who had never broken the sixth commandment was murdered for murderers. So trust in him. Believe in his word and keep his law. You know, every year since I've been here, I've had to knock down a nest of wasps that likes to, they like to grow right up in the corner of the front door. And I have to keep doing it every year. So friends, don't be, don't be given to despondency. If once you root out one of those nests, sooner or later another one's going to come along. You're going to have to rip that one out as well. That's just the Christian life. It's going to be a lifelong struggle, but fighting, carry on. Carry on, friends. Continue fighting the good fight. When Christ returns, he's going to exterminate every murder hornet and every nest in your heart. But until he comes, let's get some raid. Let's pray. Well, Lord our God, I pray that you would use your word to encourage those who need encouraging and build up those who need building up and rebuking those who need rebuke. Lord, as I've contemplated this sermon, I've realized there's a lot more murder in my heart than I would like to admit. But Lord, I trust in, I trust in our great high priest, Jesus Christ who was murdered for murderers like me. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this room would, would look to Christ with me, would trust in him alone to forgive them of their murderers of heart, and press on and root out the, heart, the, the, the nest of envy and, and pride in our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.